The premier event for infection prevention and control is coming to San Antonio this June. APIC's annual conference brings you the latest research, innovative products, and practical knowledge to help you prevent infection. From inspiring keynotes to thought-provoking panel discussions, APIC 24 curates an extraordinary platform for knowledge exchange. Meet IPs from around the world who face the same daily challenges as you. If you work in infection prevention and control, you don't want to miss this event. Learn more and register to join us in person or virtually at annual.apic.org. You're listening to The Five Second Rule, brought to you by APIC, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. Together with our nearly 16,000 members, we strive to create a safer world through the prevention of infection. Join us while we talk to infection preventionists and other experts to learn the truth about some common myths related to the risk of infection and to get tips to keep yourself and the people around you safe from infection. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Apex The Five Second Rule. Today's episode is, hey, not all bugs are bad. Most of the time here at The Five Second Rule, we're talking about evil pathogens, disease, what the public and other healthcare workers need to do to keep themselves safe. But today, we're going to have a little bit more fun and talk about some of the microbes that Practice that give us joy in life, and um, those microbes help us uh, appreciate um, some of the foods we eat and some of the some of the beverages we enjoy. To help us uh, understand a little bit more about how this all works, we are joined by two of Apex finest. We have Salah Kuteshat, who is a consultant in infection prevention and healthcare epidemiology. He holds a PhD in microbiology and um, has a master's in medical biology. So he really knows what he's talking about when it comes to these microbes. Welcome, Salah. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. And joining Salah is... uh, Timothy Wimkin, who is Associate Professor at St. Louis University School of Medicine. And uh, he also has a doctorate in public health from the University of Louisville. And um, both Salah and Tim have served on committees uh, at APIC and have uh, been a great source of information in this area. So welcome, Tim. Hey, thanks for having me. Okay, uh, I'm going to get right to it. Um, we all know the famous quote, what was it from, I think it's attributed to, um, is it Ben Franklin, you know, beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy, right? Absolutely. Delicious. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about, you know, beer and other fermented um foods and beverages. Salah, I know you, you enjoy... um making is it yogurt yeah okay all right so we're gonna get right to it um here's the thing i um i know that right now um if you pick up magazines you talk to different folks there's this whole uh, fascination interest in the microbiome probiotics and how um how that's so important for our health and well-being and so i want to get to some of that but before we, we get into, you know, the microbiome and some of your expertise in microbiology, talk to me a little bit about your journey getting involved with, um, in your case, Salah, making yogurt. <laughs> what a great question. So, so it, it's all, it, we all do things because of a need. And I am one of those. I think some people like to to do things because uh, they read about it. I am more of a needs based person. So I grew up in the Middle East. Yogurt is is really a, a part of life. And I I actually grew up watching my mom making uh, cheese from yogurt. So that's another thing which is similar to cream cheese. So and to make it, you need 
a lot of yogurt. So I decided, well, you know what? I need to, to, to make my own yogurt. So here you go. I uh, uh, asked my mom, how do you make yogurt? And it, I found out that it's really easy and simple. I remember actually making it. You boil the milk to get rid of the bacteria that is not needed in changing the milk, allowing the specific bacteria that convert milk into yogurt, which, which is really changing the molecules of protein in the milk to make it more of a solid state. And so, which is something that you get from just buying uh, yogurt from the store. So I started making it a, a, a based on my mom's recipe and it really didn't change. The only difference now is that I have the incubator, which is keeping that uh, uh, milk incubating at 37 degrees centigrade. Uh, and then uh, uh, you, uh, I've been making it for, I don't know how long, so it's part of my almost daily routine. You know, every other day I make a batch of yogurt and then I put it in, in, in cheesecloth and I make my cheese out of it. But being a microbiologist, I fully understood the process of the making of the yogurt, how bacteria actually denatures the protein by changing the pH in the milk and it's uh, uh, lactobacilli actually is, changes the, the composition of uh, the milk into more acidic. And I think the pH turns into a pH 4, which is very acidic. And that's how the protein curdles. And then you get your protein and it separates the water. Milk is mostly water. And then you get the protein in there. This is the part of the show where definitely I hear that research doctorate in microbiology because <laughs> you're making it sound like it's easy and maybe it is. And I, you know, so, so let me just make sure I understand. Obviously, culturally growing up, yogurt is a big part of, of the diet and, and your life in the, in the Middle East. And mom used to make um, the cheese from the yogurt. And so you, that just is what you carried with you um, over the years. And that's awesome and great. You know, I actually go to the store and buy yogurt. And um, I'm sure it's not as good as yours. But just so I'm understanding, you know, you basically take milk. And I I thought it was all about, okay, it's bad milk. It, it you know, it, but you're saying you heat it to a, a, a high yeah. temperature to kill the back yeah. some bacteria, yeah. but then you yeah. need what is this lactobacillus? So, so yeah. So you start with a culture. Great, great question. So you heat the milk to get rid of the bacteria that is not needed because certain each bacterium has its own enzymes that digest sugars and proteins. So. You boil it to get rid of the bacteria, that existing bacteria in the milk, and you add what's called a culture, which is a spoonful to a, a gallon of milk, let's say a spoonful or two tablespoons of yogurt to start. This is the starter. After okay. it, you cool down the milk, after you boil it, you cool it down to 37 degrees, and then you add that starter, which contains the bacteria, the specific bacteria that is needed to change the pH of that milk. And then you incubate for overnight at 37 degrees, Sounds which is in the old days. Let me make it simple. You're right. It's very scientific. Simply put, you uh, take a blanket and wrap that container in a blanket overnight, and you get up in the morning, and you have actually a solid yogurt, and then you can see that watery part separating from the yogurt. So the yogurt that you buy in the store, what's really interesting, and I learned that recently, they process it differently to keep it solid and uh, try to keep as much water as possible. So they add powdered milk to that liquid milk to keep it solid. 
So there are different processes to that changes the consistency of the milk, uh, that yogurt. Okay. Is it uh, is this more clear? Um, well, we'll let our listeners decide. Um, <laughs> I'm, yeah, it is. I mean, it is clear. I understand that you have to kill off some bacteria, but then you're replacing it or adding this. And am I getting this right? Is it lactobacillus? Yeah. Because we like to use big fancy words here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have in front of me some notes that say that you obviously, in order to make yogurt, you need milk. And yeah. then um, typically I have here, and I'm, uh, you know, I Googled this, but two species of bacteria called Lactobacillus bulgaricus. And, oh, I'm going to say this one, Streptococcus thermophilus. And that sounds really ominous. But from your experience with your, you know, microbiology background are is that is that accurate you know it's it, it's it's accurate the key i think for for it to, to keep the science on the side and i try to sideline the science although we all like to use that jargon it's really bacteria that digests the sugars and and proteins in, and mainly the sugars and converts it to acid. And that's how you change the pH and then you convert uh, that milk into more of the protein component of the milk. Okay. So that's really the conversion, changing the pH. It, and let me add one thing, which is really interesting, because that's another experiment that I did in my kitchen lab, and I do it all the time. Is so? So uh, why did we make yogurt? Actually, in in that, if you go back to the cultures, cultures as human cultures and not bacteria cultures, it, we actually wanted. We didn't want to waste anything. So we wanted to preserve the milk, and milk does not last that long, even after it's pasteurized. So what did they do? They found ways to preserve milk and changed it into, and it's all by accident, not by design, changed it into those uh, uh, products like milk, uh, like yogurt and cheese. So the other experiment that I, I did in my kitchen lab is take a gallon of milk, boil it, and then add some vinegar or lemon juice. And you get cheese. Mm -hmm. It's different, although you change the pH, but it's different in taste than a yogurt. So those are different mechanisms. So when you use when you use bacteria, you get a different process than when you use a purely chemical chemical uh, process. Interesting. Yeah. Let me ask you this and Tim we're going to get to to you in a minute here, but um Salah, what about kefir? Cuz I put kefir on my on my granola and it's more sour than yogurt okay and again i'm quoting sort of pop culture yeah, yeah. um it's it's meant it's it's better you know you get more bacteria in your gut so have you ever made kefir and what is the difference in terms of the process or the bacteria so so yogurt is yogurt it's just different grades of yogurt. This is how I see it. How long you incubate, how long you keep it under that blanket determines how sour your yogurt is. Uh, we, when I first got exposed to that Western culture, I was shocked that yogurt is sweet and they add fruits to it and I couldn't handle it. What? My yogurt is more sour and actually it lasts longer. The more acidic your yogurt is, the longer it's going to last. So it's it's a process of preserving that product for longer usage. So, so yes, it has more bacteria because you kept it in your incubator longer. Is it better or worse? It, in, in my mind, they're all good because they have those natural bacteria in them. Does that answer the question? It does. Tim, do you eat yogurt? I do occasionally. Um, is I, you know, 
prefer uh, more liquidy beverages. <laughs> more, <laughs> no, more viscosity. Good, though, yeah. More viscosity in your. I've yet to have Salas yogurt. Uh, one day. One day. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. Let me ask you, and um, Salah, what do you think of this idea about health and well being? From a, a microbiology perspective, an infection preventionist, the importance of eating fermented foods. You, you know what, what's really interesting, and I may sound very old fashioned, uh, but it's, it's the way I grew up. We actually moved away as a society from the natural food uh, process. Uh, we don't cook our own food. We like processed foods, and we went through an era of everything was processed, which meant that fresh fruits and vegetables became almost non-existent in our diet because it's much easier to open a can and eat the can. And it's cheaper, too, which is really sad. So, mm. so in my mind, exposure, if you go back to, and I'm going to digress a little bit, to blood groups and antibodies, naturally occurring antibodies to blood groups, there is a, a theory that they're actually formed in humans due to exposure to bacteria that are associated with our digestion of food products. So, fresh fruits and vegetables. So, so that intimate relationship between microbes and human has uh, it, it is so beneficial and i think we broke that cycle at one point and now you can see how many people are going back i, I am not an extremist so i'm into the balance we, we we need not to to be so extreme but i think that relationship between the microbial uh, world and the human world is so intimate, and and uh, I'm sure Tim is is, is going to talk about this, he, and later we'll talk about the microbiome. But we need not to ignore that. So I am uh, fresh, 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 and make your own products. And the fermentation is is actually more of a preservation of that product more than anything else. Got it, Tim. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to you because. And we're going to circle back. So everyone, you know, hold on to that notion of health and well-being and, and bacteria and its utility for human for humans. But Tim, um, talk to us because you have great interest in uh, something that's also near and dear to me, and that's beer. Um, and that involves yeasts. And I think that here at the five second rule, we, we just haven't given enough props to yeast. So talk to us about beer and beer making and how you got in, or not beer making, but beer loving. <laughs> talk to us about how you got into that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, when I was in undergrad, I was a microbiologist, and I remember making beer in lab. And I didn't drink at the time. I, who knows? I didn't know what I was missing out on. I didn't drink in undergrad. I mean, what the heck? I'm the only person in the world who doesn't drink in undergrad. Um so, but I remember making it and thinking, yeah, it's kind of cool, you know, just the, the science behind it. Um, and then, you know, like Salah, you kind of do stuff because you have to, and I have to drink. <laughs> so, and by the way, <laughs> let me just, let me, this is a public service announcement. Avic <laughs> and the five second rule do encourage responsible drinking. And um, so just need to put that out there, everybody. Absolutely. So don't email and send us hate <laughs> Thanks, Tim. And Please as, proceed. Yeah. No, as Salah mentioned, it, like you and like you said, it, you know, it's all moderation. You know, too much of anything is a bad thing. Uh, but you know, it, it, I, I just kind of got interested in in the topic, and then, you know, obviously, I started enjoying it. And um, you know, now in the COVID times, kind of starting to help a lot of the brewers in town with their um, infection prevention strategies around COVID. So you know, kind of links the personal piece of infection prevention, like, you know, protecting the public from COVID, protecting the workers from COVID, as well as, you know, backtracking into, you know, how do we prevent contaminating beer? Because uh, it's really, as we'll talk about, it, I'm sure in a little while, it's, it's really the same processes as protecting food and protecting beer as it is protecting people. Isn't that fascinating? And I know, Tim, you were very instrumental at a 
uh, at an APIC annual conference where we worked closely with a, a microbrewery out west. I shouldn't say out west in the United States. Okay, <laughs> everybody knows I'm on the East Coast. Um, so you were really instrumental in, in coordinating that. And what was fascinating to APIC members, the infection preventionists and all the people that were at this conference was the the parallels between managing aerosolized bacteria, ensuring clean lines um, for the the brewery, and what our members do in the hospital trying to keep people safe. So talk to us about um, what you learned and what was shared there in terms of, you know, we, we talked about cleaning and disinfection. We talked about personal protective equipment. All of these, by the way, um, here at the five second rule, you know, we have episodes on that. But tell us a little bit about what you learned and what what our listeners might find fascinating about that beer making process. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, disinfectants become absolutely critical, um, in, just like in the hospital. So, you know, your PPE, you're protecting yourself from some of the disinfectants, but you're also protecting the beer from other bacteria that shouldn't be there. Just like in Salaj yogurt, you, you want to get rid of stuff that you don't need there. You don't want there because every organism is going to have its own metabolism. And that metabolism is going to excrete some byproduct, whether it be an acid to lower the pH and make something sour or, you know, uh, create something like vinegar or whatever to make, you know, you've opened a bottle of wine. Does it taste like vinegar? <clears throat> you know, it's not a good wine, but in the beer making industry, you know, especially with the craft beer boom, and now you have all these breweries who are like making super crazy stuff. I mean, you have pastry stouts that, you know, taste exactly like whatever, a coconut cream pie. And then you have milkshake IPAs and you have all this stuff where they're adding actual food to the beer to make it taste like a certain food. Um, and, and to do some of that, you also need different organisms. You know, to, historically, we just use Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And you kind of create your lager, create your ale, and it's kind of that traditional beer style. But now we have a lot of other organisms that we can add. Things like Pediococcus um, you know, creates a ton of lactic acid uh, and also kind of a buttery kind of flavor. Uh, lactobacillus we use a lot in brewing to make a like sour beer. If you've ever had a sour beer, it's usually at least a little bit of lactobacillus, a nice, clean, tart, uh, refreshing sour Britannomyces uh, is one of my favorites, actually. It's uh, something that you can find in like a Lambic beer in Belgium. Um, mm. uh, the flavors that that organism is going to create are, I think, often described as like a barnyard flavor, or a horse blanket, <laughs> as horrible as that might sound to that drink. It's absolutely delicious. Uh, but these are things that are floating in the air. So, you know, like traditional Lambic style, you're going to kind of create the wart and, and, you know, the lay out the liquid on a, on a table in a barn. And the history is, you know, let what's in the air land in the liquid and ferment it. So, you know, you can only do it in certain seasons. You can only do it in certain times and different weather patterns can really allow you or not allow you to create that particular beer to get that flavor that you want. So kind of like in winemaking terroir, um, as far as what's in the soil for the grapes. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And with beer, it becomes in, in these types of styles with open fermentation, it's, it becomes what's in the air. Um, and a lot of these things are aerosolized. So, you know, if you're at a, a mass brewery um, and you're creating regular beer, you know, a, a lager or a regular ales or something, and you also have sour beer, all those souring bacteria and yeast can aerosolize and you don't want those to aerosolize and land in your, uh, regular beer, uh, you know, there's an issue in 2015 with a famous brewery in Chicago, and they have an annual release of this um, bourbon barrel aged stout. And uh, essentially, by accident, all of their barrel aged stout got infected. So, you know, you open up this barrel aged stout, you expect it to taste like bourbon, you know, tobacco flavors, these types of things, and you get uh, like a gross cough syrup cherry flavor. That's not really what you want. <laughs> So that would be the equivalent of some outbreak or cluster. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, yeah. You know, if I can make that analogy, is that right? So you Absolutely. could potentially, just like human outbreaks, that can happen in a brewery. 
Yep, absolutely. And you can use uh, uh, the awesome thing is you can use the CDC's outbreak investigation steps to track down the source. Interesting. So tell us what you do as an infection preventionist helping these brewers in terms of managing the process. Yeah, a lot of it comes down to like, you know, disinfectant selections and, you know, um, you know, kind of processes, really, just like in healthcare, you know, you have human factors and, you know, people like to find workarounds to things and, you know, just kind of traditional approaches to stuff. Oh, we've always done it this way, but you have to think about, you know, if you're going to, um, even like a home brewer, you know, if you're not sanitizing your stuff, say everything is sanitized, but then you have this bag of yeast that you need to open the bag because you bought, bought it from Amazon or whatever. And, uh, as soon as you open it up, you could contaminate that bag because you didn't wash your hands correctly or you didn't sanitize the bag as you should have. Um, I think a lot of beer, actually, the corollaries to surgical side infections and surgery is, is much is, is really close, actually, because your hands are so critical. Disinfection is so critical. The instruments are so critical. Um, and, you know, boiling, like in Salah, when he's making yogurt, you boil that milk and in, in beer, you boil the barley or whatever that you're going to uh, create your base from to get rid of all those bacteria. That's just like a site scrub. You know, it's using whatever your chlorhexidine alcohol scrub to, to get rid of whatever's on the skin. So when you make that cut, you don't contaminate it. It's the same thing um, when you're making beer. Wow. I mean, the next time I have a beer... <laughs> It's a lot of work. That's why it's I don't brew it myself. Work. Everyone else no. does it way better than me. <laughs> <laughs> and the next time I have my Kefirin yogurt. But let me go back. First of all, let's clarify, because we hear, you know, we know about bacteria. Our listeners um, are well-versed on the differences among vi- viruses, bacteria, and fungi. When we say yeast, what are we saying? Salah? Um, so, so uh, fungi are like Tim and I, and it rhymes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <so> <laughs> fungi sorry, are I, like... Uh, I uh, took that opportunity to... Okay. You gave me that opening. So, so yeast is a fungus. And it, when we look at microbes, the microbial world, those are the three kind of entities where uh, viruses are what I call them the subcellular, where our bacteria bacteria are cellular. And when you go to the fungi, you start getting into the multicellular. And I think the best example, I mean, yeast is a great example because that's the first one that we use a lot in our food and preparation of, of food products. Uh, look at your bread. Uh, but beer is... is a bigger one. Uh, beer and bread are almost the same. People eat them together or, yeah. So so I think those are the three Weekly. categories in, in our microbial world. Great, great. Oh, my God. I, I also remember um, hearing that, you know, with beer making, so, so let, me, let me just say that I think it's important to talk about uh, biofilm. Um, so I, I seem to recall, I want – Tim, for you to clarify, you know, when you go to the bar and you order or a restaurant and you order a beer from a keg, like I, I personally like my beer on tap. Um, the, the bartender is, is getting your beer, but that beer is kind of being, it comes through a line. Help me understand that because that line can become contaminated with, with residue or biofilm is that or am i making that up yeah no absolutely um and you know right before covid um i used some of my credit card points and got a kegerator at home because i i agree with you oh. having it on draft is way better uh, and it's significantly cheaper <laughs> um not so good for your waistline though when you have you know a month of working tell from me, home <laughs> tell me about it tell me about it no but talk to us about that process and how um brewers have to manage the lines yeah so you know all those lines are just essentially like PVC, you know, it's, it's, it's plastic. So, you know, uh, bacteria and, and any biofilm sticks to plastic really well. You know, any, you open up a PVC drain under your sink and, you know, it's filled with goo. That's all biofilm. Um, sometimes in our older hospitals, that's what's holding the pipes together. <laughs> Just 
can, can be problematic uh, also. But yeah, you know, when you're making beer or even, you know, if you just change a keg, you know, a lot of it depends on if you're switching the kind of beer that is using that same line. Sometimes you just have to replace the line. Um, it's, it's easy to do. I mean, those are cheap, you know, lines that are usually pretty short, it's, you know, screw clamps and a, a piece of PVC pipe. Uh, but you know, if you're, uh, you know, some beers are, have this secondary fermentation even. So, you know, you ferment it, you know, typical beer that we think about, but sometimes, um, to when, after it gets bottled, they'll actually throw more yeast in the bottle or bacteria in the bottle and let it sit there. And those are beers that, you know, you can sit on a shelf for 30, 40 years and it just gets better over time, changes flavor, almost like a wine. Um, so if you have something like that, where there's a lot of live organisms in the beer and that's coming through the line, those organisms are going to certainly form a lot of biofilm, um, on that, on that plastic. So if you're going to switch it then to, you know, whatever, or just a traditional lager, you're going to need to probably change the line or try to clean the lines. At least, you know, there's a lot of good line cleaner, um, beer line cleaner stuff, um, that are just disinfectants and things, but you know, biofilms is, is tough. Uh, it's, it's really hard to penetrate. It's hard to get rid of. You really need that physical scrub. So just kind of running a chemical through the line doesn't always can sterilize the surface, but it doesn't sterilize it all the way down, which is, you know, kind of, you know, like NIH several years ago when they had their CRE outbreak Mm -hmm. and, you know, they trace some of it at least to the sink drain traps. And we've seen historically in a lot of articles, even in AGIC where, you know, you have the old disinfect the the sewer line or the you know, the drain lines in your hospital you fill up the sinks with bleach concerted effort one two three pull the plug and you know let the bleach drain down that just going to sterilize the surface of all those biofilms which will prevent aerosolization from the sinks and stuff uh, and then you know right now but you know in 30 minutes from now when those bacteria multiply it's just back to back to where it was so same thing with beer wow i mean i could just Excuse me, I could go on all day about this, but let me bring it back to, you know, certainly in the infection prevention community, um, when we look at uh, well-being and health, there is a an ongoing, you know, studies, discussion around what is the critical point at which a microbe, whether it's virus, bacteria, or fungi becomes dangerous, right? So, so we talk about, you know, we have an episode on Legionella, which is a naturally occurring bacteria, right? At what point does that become dangerous? You know, I think in food, Salah, you started to say, you know, first you and, and Tim with beer, you know, you have to boil off the bad stuff. And then there is you know, then you allow what you want in terms of the microbe to create that pH, that that flavor profile. What can you share, Salah, about that that you know that point of no return at which it's either too much or too little, and it all goes, you know, south. <laughs> Um, and that's true with, with pathogens that we talk about in terms yeah. of disease. You know, what is then the infectious dose, if you will? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 a great question. And I, I always, I'm a, I actually, I'm a friend of microbes, which is we, yeah. almost illogical for somebody who is working in infection prevention. And let me explain why I'm a friend of microbes, because I fully understand them. And I treat them with care. Microbes are part of our world and we need them. We just established that for our beer and wine and, and cheese and yogurt, we need those microbes. So let's let's believe that they're necessary. And now what is the critical point of moving from good to bad? That's really important. And I'll use the gut microbiome as an example. We really have a great number of microbes in our gut and we map them and we have beautiful, colorful pictures of that microbiome. But if we disturb that microbiome, one example is antibiotics. And if we continue to harass them, we change 
that structure, uh, that community actually, of peaceful bacteria and yeast, and we allow some of them to dominate. And when there's dominance of one, it may lead to disease. And the best example is Clostridium. Uh, it's, it's a gastrointestinal, uh, the, the pathogen, and the organism is present in the microbiome. But when we treat patients with antibiotics, we create an environment for Clostridium to dominate, and it causes the C, what we call the C. diff diarrhea, and it's an awful disease. So that's an example of how when we uh, create an imbalance within an environment, we create disease. Excellent, excellent point. Yeah, there's a lot to be said around the importance of antimicrobial stewardship and the impact that that's had. Tim, what what do you say in terms of, you know, we uh, beer making and that credit, that point of no return, not just with flavor, but there are potential dangers, correct? Yeah, I mean, you know, you don't want, I mean, you certainly don't want pathogens in your beer. You don't want pathogens in any of your food, which could always be a risk. It, it's, it's a low risk, but it's not zero. Um, you know, the, the biggest risk in beer is, you know, if you don't have enough of that, quote, infectious dose, you're not going to have a high enough alcohol content. Your beer is going to not do what you want. Um, you get too much, you know, you can have different flavor profiles. You just ruin your batch, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, with secondary fermented beers, you know, the more complex things, you add the wrong thing, you add the wrong amount of sugar, you add the wrong organism, um, you know, the bottle could explode. <laughs> you know, you have a bigger risk of getting, you know, punctured in the eye with a piece of broken glass or, you know, a can exploding because there was too much, you know, carbon dioxide formed. But it goes back to the microbiome too, you know, especially with secondary fermented stuff, you know, it can act like probiotics and, and it help rebalance those flora. I think in medicine, we have a tendency to really think of our bodies as these little silos just because of the way medicine is structured. You know, we have specialists for everything. You know, you go to the neurologist, you go to the cardiologist, whatever. But really, you know, it's obviously a, a one system and it all interacts with each other. And, you know, powers of deduction suggest that the biggest system is going to be the one that's kind of the most impactful in, on the whole system. And that the biggest system is, is your gut. And the biggest thing in your gut is the gut bacteria. So like Salah mentioned, the, the wrong imbalance and, you know, the epithelial cells can loosen up and you get leaky gut syndrome if you have too many gram negatives in your gut. And then does the lipopolysaccharide, that endotoxin leaks into your systemic circulation, causes inflammation. You know, there's a lot of evidence that, uh, uh, inflammatory diseases, even like depression, for example, uh, is, uh, probably a, a, has a major inflammatory component, can produce um, risks for C. diff beyond even like proton pump inhibitors and stuff that we've been you know, focused yeah. on a lot. So uh, it's really interesting. Fascinating. And we've used a lot of really big, fancy words, <laughs> which, you know, we always want to do. But yeah, and I've also heard, you know, getting into the diversity of the microbes. Um, I was at a conference once, and I'm going to get this wrong. So if you are listening, and you have the the, the right data, please send it to podcast at apic.org. But essentially over, and Salah, you alluded to this in terms of the human evolution, you know, early humans had, and I'm just going to make this number up, let's say 10 billion different types of microbes in it in our guts. Now, in most of, you know, I'll say the developing world, um, you know, it's like three, three million. I know those aren't exact. Don't quote yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. That's not yeah. coming from a scientific journal. So, but, but the idea is that we've lost the diversity in our, in our gut or even, you know, skin microbiome. Is, is that an, a, a generally accurate concept that I've just said? He, I, I'm not no, no. familiar with this information. I, I really don't want to speculate on that. Tim, do you have anything? Yeah, you know, there's these, like the hygiene hypothesis, for example. Yeah. You, we become this hyper-clean society and our, our organisms that were made to live with genetically throughout, you know, millions of years of history um, 
change? And, you know, what kind of impact does that have? It's really hard to tease out exactly what impact it has because, you know, everything changes, at least to some extent, in concert with each other. You know, our, our genetics, we have epigenetics where, you know, different genes change over time due to, you know, things being added onto our genome. And um, so it's hard to know, you know, exactly what's going on, uh, you know, especially like, you know, in hospital, we have a, actually a study coming out, I'll, I'll self-plug in, in AJIC soon on, you know, what happens to your skin microbiome after you use chlorhexidine. Um, and, you know, these are things that, you know, we, throughout, at least throughout the U.S., you go to the ICU, you're probably getting chlorhexidine baths every day, but we, you know, we never really look at what impact that has from a stewardship perspective, because like you mentioned, antimicrobial stewardship and that antimicrobial is not just antibiotics. It's not just antibiotic stewardship anymore. We need stewardship for disinfectants. We need stewardship for antiseptics, for everything, because it all impacts the system that is our bodies. Wow. Oh my God, this has been great. I could just keep going, but I can't. Um, so I do think, though, we might want to work on an episode to really, you know, get our facts straight on this notion of, you know, human evolution and, um, and microbes. So happy to, to get um, more input on that. I can't thank you both enough for taking the time to talk with us today about your personal hobby passions of yogurt uh, and beer making and sharing with us how those processes are similar to what you do as infection preventionists and to really, you know, share with the world that um, we do. We have this relationship with microbes. They're not all bad, um, that there is a need to, as Salah said, to to befriend them, but just like sometimes company, you know, can overstay their welcome. (laughs) So good can go to bad pretty quickly. We have to be mindful of that. Um, So I can't thank you enough for sharing your expertise. And, um, and I just want to remind everybody to check out all of the great resources that we have at www.apic.org. And to, um, to share with us, if you too like to make any of these fermented foods, just let us know at podcast at apic.org. Thanks for listening to The Five Second Rule, produced by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology Staff and the APIC Communications Committee, in partnership with Human Factor. Audio tech is Blake Alphen.